Welcome back to Duckman Cycles of EW Garage. I'm your host, the Duckman. <laughs> We're back today with my 1956 Volkswagen Beetle, also known as Eleanor. And if you remember the history on this car, for those of you that are just coming out here for the first time, I'm spitting while I talk. <laughs> so for those of you coming out here the first time that haven't seen one of my videos before, Eleanor is my 1956 Volkswagen Beetle. And Eleanor had such severe rot that I ended up having to rebuild her. And just about every panel on this car needed to be replaced somehow. So I figured if I'm going to put that much work into it, I know it's never going to be right again. So I made myself a custom. And the roof on this car has been chopped and my idiot neighbor is running a chainsaw. <laughs> and he wasn't running it just a minute ago, but no sooner I'm starting the video, he's running a chainsaw. But anyway, I built this car completely custom and most of it from scratch. I actually used old washing machines and stove panels and uh, formed the, the things that I need to make this car into what you see. It still needs a little bit more work, uh, well I should say actually a lot more work really when you look at it from, from the bigger picture. As far as welding is concerned, there's not a whole lot of that I need, need to do and it's mostly on the inside. But we've built this chassis here beneath it and you remember the last video we put the Kaffir brace on there or the truss brace or whatever it is you guys like to call it. My rear end on here is all consisting of 944 parts and whatever else I could customize to make the fit such, such as the empty sway bar that you see back here. You know that was something custom that I had to make fit. Now these shocks that are on here I did a little research on these and I wondered why the print on them is upside down when they're in the upright position like this and it turns out I put the shocks in upside down. <laughs> so that's the reason why the print is upside down. And I, I thought that was kind of unusual. And it is important, actually, they did say in the instructions from the manufacturer of these shocks, that they must be installed and in, in, oriented in the proper position. So in other words, the chrome shafts go up. They should be in that position, but of course, knock them back down to the position they need to be. Now, I picked up some bolts that I needed for this. Because I was missing the lower shock bolt, so I got a new one. And these were a little tricky to find. I discovered that this is actually a uh, Porsche original part with a Porsche part number, and they're roughly $15 each. Uh, how about no? <laughs> I discovered uh, BMW is actually selling one too, and these are 8.8s by the way, and the BMW one is a 10.9, so actually it's the same bolt, but it's different hardness, it's, it's a heavier hardness, and theirs are a little cheaper, they run about 8 to $9, but once again, it's a BMW part, so you're going to pay that. So I went to a local industrial supply house, and I managed to find a bolt that's just a few millimeters shorter and uh, it should work just fine and total cost on that for me was three bucks yeah three bucks so you know I'll take that any day so anyways I need to put these shocks together on there um, once we got that set up I'm gonna push the chassis out of the way and we're gonna get some more welding done on this beetle I gotta get some of the interior stuff welded together as I had mentioned uh, I need to get to the inside area Let's see I'm actually around the wrong side of the car right up in here you see on the right side this area in here needs to be welded I need to do a little more fill and I need to get that straightened out. I also need to patch a hole that's up here, and that was part of the roof chop. It was a place in here where the, the metal pieces didn't fit together any longer, so I need to come up with some really awkwardly shaped part and fill it in. That side, I didn't butcher quite so badly, and I actually put in a square to fill in there, so that worked out just fine, so I'm gonna get that straightened out. And then a few other little patches around here, like the one in the A-pillar, I'm gonna make a piece for that too and get that filled in. So like, comment, and subscribe on my video. You know, don't forget to click that like. You don't forget to post a comment. My YouTube channel has really been picking up in traffic in the last few weeks. I mean, just really been picking up in traffic the last few weeks. It's really hard to keep up with the comments sometimes on my videos. Because as soon as I answer one, it's like the next one comes up. And that's something I've been trying to do. I try to answer everybody's comments, everybody that posts a comment. But sometimes my videos, you know, have a couple hundred comments and it's really hard to keep up with. <laughs> but I thank you guys for all of them. In fact, I want more than that. I want to not be able to keep up with it. I want to have to hire people to help me to keep up with the comments. So if we can grow this thing to that size, I mean, that would be awesome. It'd be really cool to actually be employing a couple people just to help me with my YouTube. But, you know, once again, I'm just dreaming. That's pretty way off in the future. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what happens as the channel continues to grow. So let's go ahead and get started on these shock absorbers for the beginning. And uh, we're going to see what happens when, when this bolt gets pulled out. What's going to happen to this truss bar? Is it going to drop? Is it going to lift up? I mean, what's going to happen? Is it going to be hard to get that bolt back into place? Am I going to have to disassemble more stuff? I don't know what I'm going to run into. But one of the designs that I do like about this truss bar is it doesn't have a stud that's pre-welded pre into this triangular portion here. Some of the... Uh, Chinese made ones actually do have a stud here so in order for you to get the shock bolt out you got to take the entire truss apart in this case the bolt is actually a stock bolt and goes in that way if I remove the bolt the shock comes out 
We're going to see if it's going to be hard to uh, get this thing realigned and put that bolt back in, but we'll see. Anyways, like, comment, subscribe. Don't forget to check out my Facebook group page, Duckman Cycles VW Garage. Join the group. We're going to discuss this as well as any other project that anybody else shares. Check out my other channels, VV the Duck VV and Skeeter the Duck. Over on VV the Duck VV, I actually uploaded some car show videos where I visited some Volkswagen shows and where we took the Volkswagens around the racetrack at Five Flag Speedways in Pensacola. Had a good time with that. I really enjoyed it. So anyways, you guys, thanks for watching. Stick around. More to come. Bah! Since we're not too far from Cajun country, I decided that I would uh, upgrade the Volkswagen engine to um, an airboat style, kind of like what you see there. That uh, box fan just happened to drop right in there, and I think if I get enough, uh, if I get enough voltage into it, that fan ought to turn fast enough to be able to push this chassis. <laughs> a couple of videos ago, a few of my viewers actually noticed that the tires on the rear here on this chassis were actually installed backward and they noticed that by looking at the directional arrows that are actually on them and yep the arrow is supposed to go the direction that the car is going so they were actually pointed in reverse because I had the tires on the wrong side and I knew I had done that about a year ago when I took the car to the car show and I kept forgetting to reverse them and it was killing me my OCD would actually keep me awake at night I would say you know geez I kind of fix those things well anyway it took a year and all of a sudden I started to get a bunch of comments about people noticing them so I fixed them in the last video now some people may ask you know why are tires directional and why do they spin certain way if you look at the top of the tire you can see that the treading kind of points to an arrow and it's also going in the direction now this is part of the tire design and what the design Design is supposed to do is that as this is driving forward if you would see this contact patch on the bottom of the road the arrow actually faces back and what it does is it slows off the water so it tries to help you from hydroplaning you can still hydroplane if there's enough water or if you're going fast enough but of course if your car is light enough you know welcome to Volkswagen land usually it's not the rear end though it's the front end it does it that's what this v-shape is all about now not all tires have that and some tires the v-shape is in the reverse direction because Due to their design, it actually functions a little differently. But usually the top of the tire, the arrow faces forward. And you'll even see that on tractor tires and other things that are similar. I mean, heck, you could even see it on the motorcycle here. See, once again, they face forward. That tire is going to be need to replace sometime soon, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> now, not all t tires are directional. The front tires, for example, that are on here, they do not have a directional rotation. And if you look at the pattern that's on there, they don't have any specific pattern that matters whether it's forward or backward. But, here's the real kicker, and this also just got noticed in the last video. These are Blizzak tires. I live in Florida. People in Florida don't know what a Blizzak is. You know, I actually come from up north, so I am familiar with it, but a Blizzak is a snow tire. <laughs> These are cold weather snow tires, and what makes them different is the compound is actually a little bit harder. The way the little treads are cut, they actually have very, very sharp edges on it. And the idea is it's supposed to be able to dig the snow out of the way, or ice, or whatever it is that you're driving on. As opposed to a tire that has a more lazy cut tread with a more soft edge to it. Yeah, these are very, very square cut. These tires are in excellent shape. I don't know how old they are, I have to check day codes on them. But they've been around for a while. I didn't have any plans on changing out to new tires yet. It's just a bad idea to put new tires on a car that's going to be sitting in the garage while I work on it and continue to build it for a few years. Because what happens to the new tires? They start to dry rot. So these tires, while I haven't dry routed yet, I figured these would be plenty, plenty of time to, left on these things to be able to just push them around the garage. And then when it comes time to drive it, if they're still in good shape, I'll put a few miles on them before I finally upgrade to some new tires. But yeah, they're Blizzak tires. Nobody even noticed it at the car shows that I've been to, and uh, <laughs> nobody noticed it on YouTube until just this week. So thanks you guys for watching and noticing those little details. It really, really means a lot to me. This shows that you guys are actually watching these videos. So thanks so much. Okay, with the chainsaw going on in the background. <laughs> hey, they just shut it off. I'll be damned. But we need to go ahead and remove this bolt. That's the upper shock mount bolt. It's also what mounts to the top of the rear truss work here. And this shock needs to be 
converted, flipped over. Now before I get into that, I also need to make a bushing for the bottom. Because what I discovered is the bolt that goes into the bottom of this shock is actually too big to go into the bushing. And the bolt is too small just to go directly into the rubber bushing here. So I'm going to have to drill this out. What I'll do is I'll probably just put it in the lathe and go ahead and bore it out. That should get it good to go, I think. Okay, there's the final product. We've got our bolt ready to go through there. We've got our bushing for the top side. And the chrome piston actually goes upwards. So it's going to go in just like that. I think it would be a good idea to get the bottom in place first. Okay, bottom is in first. Now, I did that on purpose, and I got a good and snug. It's not quite tight yet, but it is snug. I have to twist the top of it because these actually aren't completely perpendicular. They're actually one's a little bit twisted from the other, perhaps even 45 degrees. And what we got to do from here is the strap that's on here I have to take off. As soon as I take that off, this shock is going to start stretching slowly to its full length. So when it gets to about here where this bolt is at, I'm going to have to slap that bolt in as quickly as I can before that thing starts starts growing too big. <laughs> if I miss it, I'm going to have to recompress it by hand. These are new shocks and these aren't like beetle shocks. These actually require um, quite a bit more force to really get them to mush. And rather than cut that strap, I'm actually just going to pop it right off. It seems it's loose enough that it'll happen. Yeah, there it goes. Shock is growing. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. All right, now this has to go back into position so that way that bolt will then screw into the triangle that's up here. Because this is not stock, we don't have a nut here. I just connected the truss from the back frame horn mount. I didn't want to go straight. All right, there it is actually having a little trouble getting the thing started on there. That was uh, a little bit of a pain in the butt. I had to disconnect this rod over here, which is the one that connects back to the frame horns underneath the transmission. And then that gave this enough floppy play to be able to uh, get it threaded in. Once I've got this screwed back in, I'll go ahead and I'll readjust these uh, rods again to the way that I had them. <sighs> and I think that's not too bad. That's where it needs to be. Go ahead and tighten this up just a bit. We'll snug up the bottom one too. And that's all there is to it. Now we need to repeat the same thing on the other side and get the shock installed just like you see. Pretty close tolerances there to everything that's, that it's sitting next to, but the Porsche shocks cleared it before. And everybody that's used Beetle Shocks on it before hasn't had a problem with it. These are, of course, aftermarket stuff, but uh, I think it looks pretty good. Okay, let's get the one on the other side, and then put the truss rod all back together. And then we'll go ahead and get, try to get some welding done today. Okay, there are our shock absorbers. Nice and easily installed, and properly oriented. I think that's so weird to have the pistons going up and down like that uh, on the upper side just seems like a bad idea because like moisture and stuff is going to want to get in there but manufacturer knows better so that's how they're going to go I don't like the fact that that's a new bolt down there and it's all shiny and that one's not <laughs> it bothers me let's see how it works oh she's stiff wow of course there's no other weight on it other than me but once you get an engine and a transmission in there, it should soften up some. But yeah, she's stiff. And that's what I wanted. I wanted her to have a nice firm rear end. Who doesn't like a nice firm rear end? 
Well, I got interrupted by a million different phone calls today, and uh, they weren't all work-related. A couple of them were, and most of them had absolutely nothing to do with me. And because we're starting to lose daylight, it's probably not a good idea that I start body with. So I'm going to have to take a pause for the cause and uh, shut down on that just for a moment. But what I did do is I did get the shocks in, as you see. Those are in there. And I went ahead and I reinstalled the air system on the front here. So that way the front end is lifted back up. You can see that's up right now. That's about two and a half inches lower than stock due to the drop spindles that are on there. But that worked out pretty good, and that gives me the ability to um, raise it up that several inches just, just to make it easier to work on. And that's kind of a good thing, because as tall as I am, it really hurts to bend over and stay bent over for that long while working on something. So, you know, every, every few inches that you can raise the chassis saves your back that much more. So anyways, that's where we're at today. Thanks, you guys, for watching and sticking with me. I mean, this is the probably the longest rear shock video install ever. <laughs> So I thank you guys for sticking with me through it. I mean, it certainly was something. Uh, taking the truss bar back apart to, to make the shocks fit really was a pain in the ass. I mean, that's really where I burned up a lot of time. And every time I was running the lathe and I was trying to cut down those bushings to fit in those shocks, guess what happened? You guessed right. The phone rings. So I had to stop, shut the lathe off, go ahead and grab the phone, and then get back to what I was doing and have to wrap my head back around it again, starting over. And I'm, I'm not very good about coming back and leaving where I left off. It, it takes me a little extra time to get back into the groove to be able to do what I was doing. But anyway, we got them shocks on there and I think they look pretty damn good. And when I bounced on the rear there, jumping up and down, it felt nice and stiff. Uh, I think that rear end is, is going to be fucking awesome. Everything back there is really stiff, really stiff. And I want to be able to slide this car sideways in autocross and it's kind of hard to do on a Beetle anyway because it's kind of rear heavy and there's a lot of traction in the back. They also don't have a limited slip differential, but we'll get into that in a later video. But uh, something I would really like to do is take this car to autocross. Autocross is something I've always wanted to do, and the way I drive the Z, I drive it like a madman, and that's another car I'd like to take to autocross too. You know, get a set of cheap tires on the back, pick up a set of cheap tires from the, the $20 used tire dealer place, put those on there, burn them up, and then uh, put your stockers back on and drive home. <laughs> so anyways, yes, like. Comment, subscribe, please let me know that you're watching, and please let me know that you enjoy my videos. Of course, the more likes that I get, and the more comments that I get, the more my videos get seen, and the more motivated I become. That certainly puts me in a higher bracket up on YouTube, and that makes all the difference in the world. The bigger my channel grows, the better things that I can do, and um, the more and better quality videos that I can put out. And if I can get some things together, of course, the better product I can build, and the faster I can do it. Still trying to get that shop. I mentioned that a several months ago in a, in a video, but it's, it's that's still few years away I'm still collecting my, my pennies for that one but I got a lot of money together and I thought of a couple of other options instead of buying a shop perhaps moving out of this house to a place with like a three or four car garage and uh, hey, hey that would be even better yet <laughs> so uh, I mean I'll move off to the country someplace where the houses are cheap where the garages are huge I don't have a problem with that and the kind of job that I have anyway I don't have a commute you know I, I, I'm on call you know customer calls me I go fix their stuff and the further distance I am well the better they pay <laughs> So thanks very much for watching, you guys. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Boo!